Okay, so here's where we're going to begin. Um, how long does it take to return to the ground? So as I mentioned in my sort of clue, my little hint, I'm going to redefine everything. I'm going to say, let's let's just forget about what happened before um, because I, I'm asking the question, how long does it take to return to the ground? So from my maximum height, I'm, I'm viewing that as time zero. So that's my new initial condition. And I'm going to call that my origin. And the downward journey is going to be in the positive direction. So you can see there, I'm saying positive is now downward. Um, and here's my initial condition when time zero, um, I start at the origin, which is the maximum height, and then my velocity is also zero because at the maximum height, I'm not moving. That's why it's the maximum height. Now, what this means is, just, just be mindful, right? Um, my destination, returning to the ground, is gonna be in the positive direction, and I already know how far it's going to be from the original question, right? I'm gonna have to travel 32 and a half meters back toward the ground, but it'll be positive 32.5 because I'm regarding downward as positive, okay? So with that in mind, what is our, what's our force equation gonna look like? What is our acceleration equation going to look like? This is what I wrote down, okay? Now, just think about this and how similar it is to the original acceleration equation we had. The original acceleration equation had a minus uh, there because uh, gravity was working against us. So it was um, fighting, and that's why you can see it's a negative against the direction that we're moving in. But now that I've thought of positive as downward, uh, gravity is downward too, so therefore gravity should be um, positive. So that's why it's a positive 10, and the minus a fifth of V is the same resistance from the medium that we got earlier. So that's the first thing. If you're watching along and um, you didn't have the same acceleration equation, then I'm gonna ask you to pause the video and um, give it a go from here and see if you get a different answer. I suspect some of the answers that were wildly different is because we didn't even start from the same point. Okay, so that's the first comment. And then my next thing is, okay, um, at this point in my original question, in the first question, I had to choose a form for acceleration that would help me answer the original question, which was, what is y in terms of v? Um, what is the displacement vertically in terms of the velocity? Now, for that reason, if you recall, what we chose was v um, dv dy. That is a way to express the vertical acceleration. But in this case, I'm asking a question about time, right? Uh, I'm not trying to get towards the dis this displacement thing, this y value. I already know what the final y is gonna be. It's gonna be 32.5. So I'm not gonna choose v dv dy um, for this. I need something which includes time. Um, being that we've got velocity over here, so I'm gonna have to do some integration with respect to v. Um, hopefully the cogs are now turning and you're thinking, okay, which form is it gonna be? I think it's gonna be dv on dt. That's got the v that I need to integrate with respect to because there's v's on the right hand side. And then it's got a time variable, which when I integrate, t will appear and then off I go, all right? So again, um, if you chose some other form for acceleration, not dv on dt, um, I haven't done my homework to try all those other uh, kinds of approaches, but you need the t in there somewhere, right? And if I were to choose, I mean, the other form for acceleration that has time involved is um, the second derivative of, um, oh, I should have had a y up there, shouldn't I? Um, the second derivative of displacement, um, but I don't, I don't have displacement over here, I don't have any y's, so that's gonna fairly quickly, I imagine, hit a dead end. All right, so now I've kind of set up and the rest of this is gonna be the kind of, well, the algebra soup that Mrs. Lee's referred to earlier. So uh, what happens? Well, on this next line here, um, you can see what I've done is I've done the separation of variables step that I, I've done so very many times before. When you have a look at this line here, um, I'm going to integrate shortly, but just before I do, you can see there's just a teeny little of adjustment that I can make to make this easier to integrate. Um, over here on the left-hand side, um, you've got something that looks an awful lot like a um, f dash on f situation. But if 50 minus v is my f, then f dash should be negative one, right? Because I get that from the negative v. So therefore, to fix that up, I'm gonna multiply both sides by negative one, like so. And now I'm good to go. Uh, this is ready to integrate, so I'm gonna integrate the left and I'm gonna integrate the right. It's just gonna give me a log over here and a um, uh, this is going to be a linear function over here. So this is what I landed on. Um, I hope this is looking okay to you. Um, this is uh, my log of f that came from my f dash on f. 
Um, that's a fairly straightforward result, and now I've got a constant. Um, bit cheeky, I mean, I'm, this is a continuation from my previous question, so I probably should have called this constant two and called the other one constant one, uh, but thankfully, unlike in some other questions where you have to integrate like four or five or six times, just a couple, so I, I'm gonna be a bit naughty and, and leave that there, okay? So now I have to find the constant of integration, okay? As we've done before, I'm gonna use initial conditions, but just remember, we've got whole a whole different set of initial conditions than um, we did earlier. So I initially am setting, oopsie daisy, I'm initially setting um, the maximum height up there as the origin and uh, my velocity is zero. So um, this is t equals zero, and you can see here I'm gonna take advantage of this v equals zero to um, evaluate the v and the t, that'll give me my constant. Okay, so what do I get? Uh, let's do this a bit gradually. So you can see here, um, what am I going to get? You're putting in your v equals zero here, so that leaves you with a log 50 on the left-hand side, and then your t equals zero here makes that t term vanish. So that just gives me a straightforward c equals log 50. And when I substitute that back in, um, I do just a teeny bit of, um, you, can do, I, I can, you can see I do the same kind of um, log manipulation that I did before um, to make t the subject because that's what I'm trying to solve for, right? So you can see here, um, um, I've got this in here, I've got 50 minus v, uh, I've, I've actually sort of taken, um, well I've reframed this as an exponential equation, right? So e to the power of log 50 minus v is just 50 minus v. Uh, and then I've got e to the power of everything on the right hand side here. And so that log manipulation that I did earlier, what it looks like now is index laws, right? So you can see here, this uh, one exponent I can break into two. So I'm going to write that as um, e to the fifth t e to the log 50. And as I just mentioned before, um, e to the power of log k is just k. Um, I might as well, I've got the time, luxury of time here, so I might as well just write that in there as a um, something to highlight. Uh, it's a fairly easy rule to prove just using some index and log laws. So once you've got that, because e to the log 50 is just 50, um, you can see I'm going to end up with um, this 50 minus v hasn't changed on the left hand side, um, but this turns into that coefficient of 50 at the front there. And so where do we land? Um, I've now got um, v, uh, sort of, I'm, I'm tidying it up, I'm trying to get it as a function of time. 